any man should boast for now now let me show you something old testament turn to matthew chapter or ezekiel chapter 18. get ezekiel chapter 18 one hand and get uh no ezekiel i want to i want to pass here that says see i don't have my bible with me i, I stole one out of the motel this uh, Gideon Bible. And I don't bring my own Bible with me because I've got 35,000 notes in it. If I ever lost it, I lose all. It's uh, Ezekiel 14. Uh, I, I lose uh, 48 years of work, so I, I just I don't have any notes here at all. Right. Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel 14. Now, keep that there a minute, and then let me show you. Uh, oh, a fella boasting in his salvation of the Old Testament, which God accepts. Uh, I'll get to Deuteronomy under the law. Get Deuteronomy chapter 8, and I'm not going to find this one in five seconds. Uh, I want a verse here that says, when you get this land, you're to come before your Lord God with this basket full of stuff and say, my father was a Syrian and did this and that. And anybody find it before I do? Show me where it is. It's about the fifth verse in the chapter of Deuteronomy, and it's past the middle. What? How do things says my a Syrian was my father and Rain land, you call him, and you did this and do that, and so forth and so on. Bring your basket to the tabernacle. 26, five. What? 26, five. That sounds like it. 26, five. That's it. Well, here's the fellow. Here's a. Here's, here's what this fellow to say when he comes. Deuteronomy 26, verse uh, 4 and 5. You bring this basket and come down to the temple and offer and then you say this uh, verse uh, 13 then thou shalt say before the Lord thy God I have brought away the hallowed things out of my own house works and have given them to the Levite works for the stranger works the fatherless works the widow according to thy commandment works which thou hast commanded me I have not transgressed thy command works neither have I forgotten them I have not eaten there in my morning works Neither have I taken away aught there for unclean things. Works, but I've hearkened the voice of the Lord God. Works, 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 works. Faith and works. Now let me show you another one like it before we get back to Ezekiel. Come to Nehemiah. And here's Nehemiah hoping for mercy at the judgment. Look what he appeals to. Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah chapter 13. He's, he's uh, praying here. Nehemiah chapter 13. He's done the right thing and straightened people out, and he's a, he's a pretty rough character. Uh, verse 20 and 21, he drives away the people from the wall because they're selling on the Sabbath. And then in Nehemiah 13, 22, how many you found? You got Nehemiah? Raise your hand. Got a little trouble there? It's the Old Testament. <laughs> Nehemiah 13, verse 22, I command the Levites to do this and that. And when he finished these works, he says, Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. So there's faith and mercy, but he asked for God to remember him and spare him because of what he did. Verse 20, 21, you better have him try that. I'll look at it again. 
Uh, verse uh, 25, I contended with them and cursed them and smote certain of them, kind of a militant pastor, and plucked off their hair and made them swear by God, saying, you will not marry these other folks this other race. He's a racist. He's going to beat you up and curse you and pull out your hair, you know. <laughs> nice, sweet fellow. And when he gets through with that, he says, 29, remember them, O my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood of the Levites. And thus I, I claim them works, the strangers works, appointed ward of the priest works, and what has been this work for the wood offering works. Remember me, O my God, for good. For good what? Good works. It's all through there. And I watch what happens to a fellow in Ezekiel chapter 18 that does good works and then quits doing the good works. And let's see if it applies to you. I mean, suppose you get saved, live right for a while, and then make the biggest mess you ever saw. Right. What's going to happen to you? Well, uh, Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. Um, verse 24. When the righteous turneth away from his righteousness, works, and committeth iniquity, works, and doeth according to the abomination, works, shall he live? All his righteousness that he hath done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass, he hath trespassed, and in his sin that he sinned, in them shall he die. He'll die in his sins. That's what Christ said about an unsaved man. If you read not that I am eat, you shall die in your sins. And that's a fellow lived a good life and quit living it. That's not your case. Amen. 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 Thank God you're under grace, boy. Amen. You're not under faith and works. Yep. Now, we say, thank God, and yet you ever stop thinking about the advantage you have in a faith and work situation that you don't have? For example, uh, the greatest Christian ever lived in the New Testament, obviously, is Paul. And Paul says he was an example, a pattern of long suffering to those that should hereafter follow Christ. Paul says, be a follower of me as I'm a follower of Christ. Now, let me ask you something. When Paul died, did he have any money? No. Did he have any family? Did he have any church? No. Did he have any school? No. Did he have any retirement? No. Any social security? No. He didn't have a grave. That's your pattern. That's what you get for living under grace. <laughs> now you take back in the Old Testament, you know what a fellow could do? Got on his knees and said, Lord, kill my enemies. Get rid of them. I tithe, I do what you told me to do, I obey your commandments, I've done right, now kill them. And God would kill them. The Old Testament, I get out and say, I've done right, I've lived pure, I've lived a holy life, now make me rich, and you get the richest crocious. You can't do that. The penalty is handicaps come with grace. <laughs> if you're going to be saved by grace through faith plus nothing, then you don't get the privilege those fellows have. Don't you remember some place like this? Here's one, John chapter 9. A certain man blind from his mother's womb. And they said, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Works. And they said, neither. He said, neither. But the, uh, God might be glorified him. They figure a fellow was blind, he must have been living like a devil. Don't you see that thing? Brother Craig, you didn't have a time of that much, wouldn't you? Now you take, you know what happened another time? A rich young ruler came to Christ, and when he went away, he was sad, he had great possessions. And Christ said, children, how hardly shall they that have riches enter the kingdom of God? And they were astonished, and said, who then can be saved? Now, you ever think about what you just read there? I mean, Christ says, said rich fella, not many rich fella gonna make it. And they said, my God, man, if a rich man can't make it, who can? Because the guy of riches is proof the guy is godly. Yeah. Don't you see that? Who then can be saved? And he said, with well, men this is impossible, with God things all are possible. In the Old Testament, I thought I lived right. Abraham, Solomon, they get rich and good health. They were promised that under the law. Amen. Did you ever read Deuteronomy? If you do this and do that and do this and do that and do this and do that, then I'll bless you here, I'll bless you there, I'll bless you, you multiply here. Five, you put a thousand to flight, and ten, ten thousand to flight, you whip your enemies. You can go to battle. So I've kept my commandments, and let me beat the tar of my adversary, you beat him every time. Amen. And you go out there fighting, you haven't been living right, you lose the battle. Sure. Works. Amen. That's Amen. the whole thing. Now, brethren, that's what the charismatic's got going. 
You know, Benny Hinn and that bunch of jerks are telling you? They're telling you, you live right, you'll be rich. Yeah. That's what they're telling you. You know why? Because they're rich. <laughs> How'd they get rich? A bunch of suckers like you. <laughs> And when I, when, I, when, I go out, when I go out and preach, I can get in a church like this, any other church, I'm always a little nervous there when I look at the congregation because I think to myself, could there be somebody here that's been sending in money to those swingers? <laughs> I mean, I hope none of you sent any money to those fruit loops. <laughs> did any of you help, any of you help all Roberts to keep from getting killed? <laughs> Brother, you did a disservice to mankind if you did. <laughs> You should have sent him a check that bounced. <laughs> and the, the American people are suckers. And they're suckers because they're materialistic. So you want these good things, these fellows plant your seed faith. You send in for gift order. If you send in for gift order number five and send in $5,000 as a gift, we'll send you absolutely free <laughs> a ballpoint pen with the inscription, there's a sucker born every minute. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's what's going on. I mean, honestly, people, honest to God, how can anybody think that, 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 that Jimmy Baker was a preacher? How could you think that? I mean, that fish face. <laughs> and Tammy Baker. My God, people, good night. If that woman kissed you, you'd die of lead poison. <laughs> she winked at your eye, they'd stick together. Probably. We got a joke down in Pensacola. We said they took off Tammy Baker's makeup and found Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> but, but people watch that garbage. That's right, that's right. I'll get back to this in a minute. But I was talking with a fellow one time about these things. He said, well, Ruckman, he said, you're enough from another age. I said, I know that. I know I'm reactionary. I mean, I'm... I'm, I'd, I'd have done well about 1850. I mean, really. I don't. I think shoes are the devil. I get home, the first thing to do is get off my shoes, walk around the dirt. I've got stocking on right now. I don't wear them. I, I think electricity is the devil. I know it's the devil. Yeah, Telephone's the devil. Telephone's the devil, man. <laughs> Television, devil. Telegraph wires, the, the devil. Only the devil. <laughs> Car motors don't work. The devil got them. <laughs> Amen, brother. Now, I know I'm way out of way out of tune, you know, from another age, you know that kind of thing, and that's true. But that's just that's just why I am. And you take this uh, this this modern age, I I just don't fit it. It just doesn't fit. Now, in this age here, these fake evangelists and all this fakey fakey stuff, I don't see how a red-blooded man could watch that stuff on television for five minutes. And a fellow told me, he said, well, Ruckman, you're kind of a, you're kind of a Jurassic period character. And he said, you don't realize what America is like today. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you talk about your yard and your garden, your dogs and stuff. Do you ever start thinking about this? Most Americans now don't have a garden or a yard or a dog. And he said, they don't have any place to hunt. They don't have any place to fish. They're cliff dwellers. They're all stuck in these little condominiums, you know. And you, now, I knew that, but I just hadn't thought about it, you know. I've done personal work in St. Louis and Chicago and... Every door's got a latch on it, night chain. They open it that far when they talk to you. Do personal work. They're all prisoners. Right. They're all locked in. Right. And he said, uh, the average fellow in America goes to work and works a four hour week. He comes home. When he comes home, he goes to a little cubicle. Sometimes he doesn't even have a wife. Where he does have a wife, he hasn't got any children. He don't have any pets. Well, he's got a pet canary. You know? They allow him a poodle in the apartment. And so the guy comes home beat to death and nobody knows who he is, nobody cares nothing about him, and he just sits there all by himself in front of this boot tube and says, speak to me, comfort me, help me, teach me, you know, you know. And so these fellas get on and butter him up and bootlick him, you know, and we had to work for the army. And they, and makes him feel good, see? Makes him feel good. And that's what this John MacArthur, John Ankerberg, Chuck Swindoll, Benny Hinn stuff is. He's just making you think about yourself. Uh, coping and sharing and sharing and coping and coping and sharing. I think sharing is the worst cuss word in the English language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Share, you wanna share, yeah. share. Don't ever share nothing with nobody. Yeah. I mean, give it to them. Amen, brother, give it to them. Don't share it with them. Share, share. <laughs> All right, Ezekiel chapter, Ezekiel chapter 15. Ezekiel chapter 15. Now, I'm going to show you the difference. Draw this out for you in a minute. Ezekiel 15, verse 20. Though Noah... He conquered the world. Daniel, he conquered the flesh. And Job, he conquered the devil. 
That's the three the Lord picks. When the Lord wants to pick him three men that are righteous in the Old Testament, he picks Noah, Daniel, and Job. Amen. Noah and Job are not under the law. They're saved by grace through faith. Amen. Job's long before the law. Daniel's long before the law, but that, that, that uh, 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 Daniel, he's under the law. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall deliver their own souls by their righteousness. And all our righteousness are filthy rags. Now, I'll try to draw this out for you. This is one thing that they criticize Ruckman for more than anything. I call this the big flap. <laughs> and the big flap comes really, it comes, comes in this. Sometimes a pastor, a pastor do a number of things wrong, and he could go too far this way or too far this way. Bob Jones Sr. said the road to the Christian life has two hedges on both sides of it. One hedge has icicles all over it, and the other hedge is a burning bush. And if the devil can't burn you up, he'll try to free you. And if he can't free you, he'll try to burn you up. So you have over here this emotionalism and, and feeling and, and stuff all over on this side, the other side, you've got this dead orthodoxy and this dead, cold, ice cold stuff. Now the right road is right down the middle. Amen. Bob Jones Sr. says, cool head, warm heart. Cool head, warm heart. Not hot head, cool head, warm heart. So when a kid comes to our school, like your pastor's done and some of the other fellows, we do two things to him. Uh, get them going, get them fired up, we get them soul in them, make them preach on the street, make them do personal work, and we hold two revivals a year with six different preachers. So they get them from all sides, just get burned up and tore up. By the time the guy's been there three years, he's heard uh, 18, and me and the other fellow, he's heard 20 different preachers, not counting the ones that come in during the year at different times. That's to keep him hot. Then to cool him off, we give him Hebrew, Greek, and English. <laughs> and nothing will take the fire out of your soul like studying <laughs> participles and subjunctive clauses, you know, and, and nominative clauses and, and, and disjunctive conjunctions. I mean, that'll keep you dead for years. <laughs> so I mean, that's the balance sheet, you see. And what happens is many pastors simply use the Bible as a textbook to make a living with. Yeah. Right. Well, they don't believe the King James Bible, but they use it. Right. Well, some of the fellows who believe it use it. In plain words, I use it myself, but there's something you better look out for. This is not a Baptist book written for the Baptist church. This is what God said to men. It's God's book. It's got a lot more there that God's interested in that you're not interested in at all. And what Baptist pastors tend to do sometimes, they're trying to make it a Baptist book. Well, any Baptist knows a man is saved by grace through faith plus nothing. I believe that. I'm a Baptist. I'm a Baptist. I believe once you're saved, you couldn't get unsaved if you tried. Yeah. I think when you're saved, you're predestinated to be conformed to his image. Yeah. Amen. Romans 8, 29. So don't worry about me being a heretic. heretic. I don't think anybody can lose it trust Christ. Yeah. If you're born again, you can't be unborn again. Yeah. I believe all that. But I'm not a big enough fool to think all this Bible teaches that. This Bible wasn't written for the Baptist church. Yeah. Matter of fact, uh, we're in New Testament. Let's see, New Testament takes up uh, one quarter of the book. God don't think very too much highly of our dispensation. <laughs> he only gave a quarter of it. The rest is over here. Now, before I draw this thing, boy, you need to think. Now, that's real hard folks do these days. <laughs> you gotta think, T-H-I-M-K, think. <laughs> Here are over 900 million Christians who think you can lose your salvation. All the Catholics, all the Lutherans, all the Methodists, all the Seventh-day Adventists, all the Mormons, all the JWs, all the Charismatics, all the Pentecostals, all the Episcopalians think you can lose it. Well now, you know you can't, but are you, uh, yeah. is the Lord telling us that 900 million people are all crazy? Well, they may be crazy, but they gotta have some basis for the craziness. What is it? It's the Bible. Right. They'll quote scripture to you. Now, if you don't believe that, it's because you don't do much personal work. Yeah. I do personal work all the time, still do. There are millions of Christians that don't believe you can know you're saved and don't know where they're going when they die and think you can lose it after you're saved. And they have scripture. And I know where the scriptures are. They're Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 25, Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 10, 
Hebrews chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, Revelation, I know where they are. I know exactly where they are. And they're scripture. What are you going to do with those scriptures? You just read in Ezekiel, a righteous fellow could die in his sins. There is any way anybody in this building could die in their sins if they're saved, you die in Christ. Amen. You don't die in your sins. All right, now here's the problem. Now here's Genesis 1. That's going to take a little time to get this one answered. <laughs> this is a tough one. <laughs> and this is Revelation 22, and that's eternity. Now, grace extends from there to there. Amen. Let's get that first. If it wasn't for the grace of God, nobody would be saved. Amen. So Ruckman doesn't teach that there are some periods that you're not saved by grace. Grace has to be in every period. Amen. But there, God, there are different ways of dispensation the way God deals with people. Now he says, study to show thyself approved unto God, of work not be, not be, not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That means the word of truth has proper divisions in it. And if you don't observe those divisions, you get in bad trouble. Now, I'll show you first of all how everybody in Smyrna, Delaware is a dispensationalist, even the unsaved people. Everybody in the state of Delaware that has a Bible has an Old Testament and a New Testament, right? There's a division. You can't say you're not a dispensationalist. Right. If you're not a dispensationalist, you don't believe in an Old and New Testament. That's right. You got 39 books this side, 27 books this side, divide right smack in the middle. In John, he says, the law came by Moses, back over here, but grace and truth by Jesus Christ over here. There are two of them right there. All right, so here you've got a thing here where Christ dies on the cross here, and there's a division. There's at least one there, New Testament, and one there, Old Testament, back to here. But hey, if the law came by Moses, Moses don't show up till here. Right. <clears throat> what about Cain, Abel, Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph? You got another one in there. Yep. Right. You know what you got? You got three dispensations. Unless you're just a, you know just a loony as loony to <laughs> You got three of them. <laughs> one, two, three. But you can't stop there. <laughs> if you believe you're buying Revelation chapter 20, someday Christ's going to come back and set up a 1,000 year reign on this earth. That's right. We call that premillennial. Now that thing looks like this mill, that's a thousand. Annum, that's annually. That's a year, a thousand years. So mill annum, millennial, simply means a thousand years. Now it's mentioned six times in Revelation chapter 20. The dead live not till a thousand years were finished, and Satan is bound for a thousand years. When the thousand years are over, he's released. And blessed he that so forth and so on. There are three ways to look at this thing. Uh, Post-millennial. Christ's going to come back after the millennium. Pre-millennial. Christ's going to come before the millennium. Our millennium. Ain't going to be no millennium. <laughs> now that's like, you see, if a man's a theist, he believes in God, but if he's an atheist, no God. If a man's agnostic, he's a knower. But if he's an agnostic, he's an ignorance. <laughs> now those, 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 are, those are Greek prefixes sitting up there. All right, now, man says the world's going to get better and better and better. We bring in a perfect kingdom, a new age, one global everybody, peace and earth, and then the Lord comes back. That's Darwin. <laughs> you get better and better till the perfect thing comes in. Now, let's just face it. I mean, anybody believe that is, is crippled too high for its crutches. They got one oar in the water, they're not playing with a full deck, the pilot light's blown out, and the elevator didn't get to the top floor. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how can a man with a used car believe in evolution? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me something, brethren. What gradually gets better when you leave it alone? <laughs> nothing. Why, nothing. It isn't a matter of evolution of man. Nothing gets any better if you leave it alone. Turn your dogs and cats loose in the street. Just let them run on the street there for 50 years. See, we're trying to condition them after 50 years. You think they'll get better? Um, I'll tell you, just ignore your wife for about three years. Watch what happens. <laughs> ignore your children. Just turn them loose in the street. Folks, nothing evolves. A thing can be worked on. It can be developed. It can be created. It can be developed, but it can't evolve. It isn't a matter of just Darwin being wrong. A man that believes anything is evolving is nuts. I mean, you're not evolving, you're falling apart, people. 
Now, I'll grant you ladies, makeup can do a little for you, know, make you, but you can't pull a flight of stairs. <laughs> I mean, anytime you're thinking you're getting better, you know, and you just, just try walking up six flights of stairs in the hospital. Don't run walk. <laughs> when I was 72, my kids bought me a, a, a summer camp at a hockey goalie school for pros in Chicago, Illinois. And 72, I went up there and got my hockey school. 2.30 in the afternoon, late 30 at night. I took off eight pounds a day. Eight pounds a day. And I put on four back, but I was still 20 pounds lighter when I got home and went up there. And hockey equipment, you have to wear reinforced shoes, reinforced helmet, your neck guard, and then a catcher and a blocker and your stick and a chest protector, and then uh, Shin, shin guard, the knee, the knee pads. And when that stuff gets wet, it picks up 10 pounds. You wear 30 pounds of equipment, and you pick, you sweat, you pick up 10 pounds. And, uh, and there are pictures my wife took of that thing out there when I was playing out there, showed steam come out of the top of that helmet, <laughs> just like coming out of a smokestack, a funnel. I'd throw away my glasses. I don't care how much anti fog you get, you still couldn't see nothing. I just threw them away after a while. But you take out there, that thing is like grass drill at a football team with a 40-pound sack of cement on your shoulders. It's like two 20-pound sacks on both ends. And you get down there, they make you get down like this, you get down like this, and you wait for the first one, and the guy, when he slaps the stick on the ground, the, that means the puck's coming. And he'll say, he'll say, blocker. And the next four shots will be on this side of you. And you go, whack, 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 whack over here. And they say, catcher, whack. Quack, 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 quack here. Center, here, left, here, over, oh, right, here. Then he gets down and says, block the goal, yeah, like this. Stop it coming up here. Get over here. Stop it over here. Come up here, like this. And he says, whack, here it comes. Get back a black kid and says, down like this. Bark, whack, here it comes again, get a black kid. Line your back like this. Whack, here it comes, you get the like this. <laughs> now you know something. That's all right if you guys under 30. <laughs> But boy, you get over 60, that gets me a chore. <laughs> and you might well, that, that's the first time I ever realized in my life the old gray mare wasn't what she used to be. <laughs> Up till then, I've been taking Taekwondo and Aikido and karate and running three miles a day and that kind of stuff. I thought I was kind of keeping my youth, you know. Boy, did I have a shot coming, man. <laughs> I mean, six hours of that stuff every day, boy, for five days. And I mean, boy, I couldn't, I couldn't keep up with my wife walking to the car. <laughs> Boy, you can't keep up with a 40-year-old woman. You got problems, man. <laughs> I'd come out there, honey, would you walk a little slower? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I learned by that? It's running down. You don't run up, you run down. Amen. Look at there. One, two, three, four. Now, if you know your Bible, you know something else. There's a period of time right before the Lord comes back called the Great Tribulation. Right? Amen. One, two, three, four, five. Wait a minute. Adam and Eve were in perfect condition before they fell. They didn't follow Genesis 3. One, two, three, four, five, six, eternity, seven. You got seven dispensations. A man that doesn't believe in dispensation is not a Bible student or a Bible reader. The right divisions, you have to observe those things. Now let's just take this faith and work stuff. Genesis 3. Before Genesis 3, how were Adam and Eve saved? A fellow said, the grace through faith, that's insanity. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things what? What? They saw them every day. Amen. Walk with them and talk with them. They couldn't possibly have been saved by faith, by grace through faith. They saw it. Works. Take it, you're dead meat. Leave it alone, you're okay. They're not the same. Now look at this one here. When Christ comes back here and sits down on the throne of David at Jerusalem, all the nations will come to him at the Feast of Tabernacles and worship him. Right there. Is a man saved by grace through faith right there? Why, he's looking right at Jesus Christ. They'll say, what are these holes in your hands and your feet? Uh, those that, and your side, those which I wounded the house of my friends, they see it. Works. 
You know how you get saved in the millennium? You'd never guess. That's how you get saved. Yeah. And if your right hand offends you, cut it off. If your right eye offends you, pluck it out. Works, 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 works. You couldn't find the crucifixion, uh, death, burial, and resurrection anywhere in the Son of the Mount. That's why every liberal preacher in Delaware likes the Son of the Mount. Yeah. They just love us. Blessed are the children, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the blessed are the... You go to hell with it. Yeah, man. You see, it was spoken over here, but it was spoken over there because the kingdom was going to come if they'd accepted Christ. Yeah. And when they did, the thing flipped over there. Yeah. Now, see the problem you got in that Bible? That Bible's a tough book. You have to compare scripture to scripture. I'll give you an easy way out. Oh, Moses, Leviticus 11. Now, you folks are seafaring folks over here on the coast. Uh, all that is in the waters you may eat, whatever has fins and scales you may eat, whatever hath not fins and scales is abomination unto you, you shall eat it, and the soul that eateth thereof shall be cut off from among his people. You go to hell if you eat crab, lobster, shrimp, or clams or oysters. Amen. 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 I always believe that. <laughs> That is true, that is true, that is true. That's the wood of the Lord. <laughs> That's Leviticus 11. Now I'm over here. First Timothy, chapter four. Every creature of God is good, and nothing be refused if you receive a thanksgiving, because it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now what's gonna do with that? They contradict. That says, eat anything you want, if you ask God to bless it, that says you eat anything without any spin of scale like scamp or catfish, you're dead meat. Amen. Now what you gonna do with that thing? You got to divide. That's right. You're gonna make a division. So when we talk about faith and works over here, we're not talking about by grace through faith over here. Now I'll show you how strong that thing is. Every Christian in this building has had his sins taken away. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Old Testament, it is impossible the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. If the fellow was saved by grace through faith, his sins weren't taken away anyway. Number two, you're adopted as God's child. Amen. Nobody in the Old Testament is adopted. Galatians says you're waiting for to get out in front of the schoolmaster to lead you to Christ before you're adopted. Number three, nobody in the Old Testament is spiritually circumcised Colossians chapter 2, the circumcision of Christ and putting on the body of the sin of the flesh. Nobody in the Old Testament is born again. You're born again in the New Testament. Nobody in the Old Testament is in Christ. You're in Christ. Nobody in the Old Testament goes to heaven when they die. They go to Abraham's bosom. You're absent of the body and present of the Lord. They're not even similar. The thing is, Abraham's salvation is a picture of your salvation, but Abraham is before the law. He's saved by grace through faith before the law, but he doesn't have his sins taken away. So he isn't justified to offer up Isaac. He has righteous imputed to him in Genesis chapter 14, and he doesn't get justified until Genesis 22. When you get saved, you get justified, sanctified, Praise redeemed, Amen. born again, Amen. reconciled, propitiated all in one shot. Amen. Amen. They're not the same. <laughs> now here you have a combination of faith and works. You say, how much faith? I don't know. I know Saul lost it and didn't get it back. How much works? I don't know. I know what David knew. David knew he was a dead duck. He committed two unpardonable sins. Under the law, there was no sacrifice for adultery or murder. The blood of Jesus Christ cleansed us from what? Oh, not in the Old Testament, no. I'll give you an example. Here's a man named Joab, and Joab kills two fellows, assassinates them. He says, I thou help my brother, and takes out a two-edged sword and strikes their guts out, gouges them. And when David died, he says to, uh, to Solomon, he said, uh, don't hold Joab innocent, uh, he's guilty. And after David died, Joab runs down and gets a hold of the horn of the altar. First Kings, chapter one, chapter two. Why? Because whatever touches the altar is holy. That's where the lamb was slain. The blood of the lamb on the altar. And Solomon says to Jehoiada, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, go down and kill him. 
And when I, the son of Jehoiada, goes down there and says, the king has said, come forth. And he says, you kill me here. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, goes back to Solomon and says, he won't leave the temple. He's still holding on the horns of the altar. And Solomon says, kill him at the altar. He's guilty of murder. There's no sacrifice for murder under the law. It's a mortal sin, the quote your nearest Catholic priest, who got you back into the Old Testament. And so Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, goes back down there and kills him at the altar. Why? Because there's no sacrifice to cover it. Now, let me show you something. Psalm 51. Psalm, can you? We got to do it now, didn't we? We got to do this time for sure. Psalm 51. Here's David right after adultery and murder. Watch him go. He knows that Old Testament. Boy, he knows it sure ain't the New Testament. Psalm 51. Here's his prayer. Uh, he's just committed adultery and murder, and Nathan has called him to account for it. Look what he says. Psalm 51:10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Amen. Verse 16. Thou desirest not sacrifice. Thou no sacrifice for murder and adultery. Else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. There's no offering for adultery and murder. The sacrifice of God or a broken spirit. There comes the faith. A broken and a contrite heart, there's the faith, thou will not despise. But notice verse 17, is not salvation in the New Testament. It's good, but a broken heart and a contrite spirit won't save you unless you receive Jesus Christ, amen? amen. Yeah, yeah. So you can come down and weep all night and have a broken heart. Listen, should my tears forever flow, should my zeal no longer know, all for sin could not atone, thou must save and thou alone, in my hand no price I bring, simply to thy cross I take. You see? So not even that would do it in the Old Testament. All right, here's what you've got. Pure works, grace through faith, faith and works, grace through faith, faith and works, works. Tribulation, faith, and works. Turn to Revelation. I'll show it to you three times. Faith and works. Now, don't think, brethren, uh, when you contact some of the church you used to go to or some of your old Christian friends, they're going to take to this kind of stuff because this is sound doctrine. This is Bible doctrine. And the body of Christ before the second coming of Christ will have ears. They won't hear sound doctrine. They'll turn against it. Uh, Revelation chapter, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, on the tribulation. This is Israel, on the tribulation. <laughs> Faith and works. The dragon was wroth with the woman, that's Israel, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, works, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ's faith. Same book, chapter 14. Same book, same place, tribulation, chapter 14. Chapter 14, verse 12. Hear the patience of the saints. Hear they that one, keep the commandments of God, works, and, and faith of Jesus. Works and faith. Amen. Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. Over and over, faith and works, faith and works, faith and works. You're not under faith and works. By grace you're saved through faith, not not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, not of works, not of works, as any man should boast. Not by works of righteousness. We, it's a different dispensation. No one isn't saved by believing on Christ. He's saved by building a boat. Abraham not saved by believing on Christ. He's saved by believing that God will give him as many children as there are stars in the heavens. The Lord said, Abraham, come abroad now and tell the stars that thou be able, so shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and God had imputed to him for righteousness. He calls Abraham out at night of the stars and look up. Abraham looks up and says, see all them stars? He says, yeah, I see them. He says, I'm going to give you that many children. And, Lord said, and Abraham said, I believe you. The Lord said, you do? <laughs> he said, yeah, I do. The Lord said, well, that's a dumb thing to do. You're 99 years old. You can't have any kids. <laughs> well, he said, I'm going to have that many children. <laughs> well, that's what I said. Well, I believe you. You do? <laughs> yeah, well, how about that? Well, let me tell you, if you're dumb enough to believe me in a thing like that, I'm going to do I'm just going to give you my righteousness. 
And that's a picture of your salvation. That's not salvation. That's a picture of your salvation. He said, Abraham believed God was appealing to righteousness, and to us it shall be imputed. If we believe on him and raise up Christ from the dead. See, it's a picture of that. It's not identical to it. Lord called me out and says, Ruckman, look up there. What do you see? I said, I said dead Jew hanging on a tree. Fly set on the scabs on his body. What about it? Lord said, that dead Jew is saved. You put your faith in that dead Jew and I'll get you to heaven. I said, okay, I believe it. You do? <laughs> yeah, I do. You said it, I believe it. Well, come on now, Ruckman. I mean, surely you have to do something. Well, you said, I believe in that dead Jew, I'll get you to heaven. Lord said, yeah, the dead Jew dying for your sins, I'll get you to heaven. I said, okay, I believe it. Lord says, no sacraments? I said, not if you say so. No baptism, not if you say so. No feeling? No, not if you, not if you say so. Well, Ruffin, if you're wild enough to believe that, tell me I'm, I'm just going to give you my righteousness. Amen. And I got it. Amen. Amen. They, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the rights of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Everyone yeah. Yeah. They can't be the same. They're not the same. All right, there's faith and works sitting over here. Revelation 22, 14. Look at these words. Revelation 22, 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments. You call that faith? Blessed they do his commandments, they may have a right to the tree of life. Where do you get off the tree of life? You live forever, Genesis 2. He drove the man out of the garden in Genesis 3 and said, lest they put forth their hand and take of the tree of life and live forever, eternal life off a tree. How do you get it? You work for it. Commandments. Amen. That can't be for you. <laughs> Folks, you don't have to take of the tree of life to get Amen. eternal life. Right. He that hath the Son hath life. Amen. God given us eternal life. This life is in his son, not a tree. Somebody's trying to get saved by the cross, I guess. You get saved by the one that died on the cross. Right. You don't get saved by the tree. Don't worry about that tree of life. You go pick it. I already got eternal life. <laughs> I gave it to you the other night, didn't I? He that hath the son hath life, and he that hath not the son of God hath not life. Man. You got the tree. <laughs> now you see how different those things are. That's faith and works. That's all works. Go there if your brother sue you in law, you give him twice as much. At this thing here, right here, you know what's going to happen? A fellow calls a fellow fool. Right. He'll be in danger of hell fire. <laughs> you think that applies over here? Why Christ said, "You fool." <laughs> <laughs> Christ said, "Oh fools and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken." Paul says, thou fool, thou which thou sowest is not quick and except to die. Well, people fools over here, no problem. But you're going to have a problem there. Amen. Now I say, you're going to have a problem. You folks that are saved aren't going to have any problem. Because right. right here, you become just like Jesus Christ. Right there. Amen. You don't have to worry about the millennium. Man, the millennium, you're a 33-year-old male. <laughs> and you'll be able to travel at the speed of light and go through closed doors. No, we hurt you in the millennium. You're just like Jesus Christ. <coughs> okay, brother, I hope that'll answer most of it. <laughs> yes, sir. Zechariah 5, 1 through 4. Uh-huh. Four sound flying saucer. Yeah, flying roll. Well, there are two flying saucers in that passage. That's a bad one. Zechariah 5. Now, I write a good bit, which is put in my life. I've written 120 books, and they're all still in print, they're still going. I just finished one 300 pages long on the Brownsville Carnival, <laughs> called uh, the Christian Disneyland. <laughs> and uh, and I, I wrote one book called uh, a Commentary on the Minor Prophets. And the Minor Prophets, I took the Minor Prophets up to uh, uh, back, uh up to, uh, I got through a back here, up through uh, Haggai, and then I stopped. And I should have volume two out, but it's been 20 years since I wrote volume one, and 20 years I haven't been able to write volume two. And the reason why I can't is because when I get to Zachary, I don't know what I'm reading. 
And I could bluff my way through. I could write a, a commentary on Zachary and bluff my way through, but I'd be bluffing because I don't know what half of it's about. Uh, Fellow sent me one time and said, Ruffin, you understand everything in the Bible? I said, no, I sure don't. He said, how many times have you been through it? That time I've been through it about 130 times. I said, oh, about 130 times. And he said, you still find stuff you don't understand? I said, yeah, that's right, I sure do. He said, well, he said, well, how do you feel about that? I said, I don't think anything about it. He said, doesn't kind of, you know, discourage I said, no. I said, if I understood everything in the Bible, I'd know somebody who wrote it didn't have any more sense than I have. <laughs> I mean, I don't profess to understand that book. Don't bother me a bit. I understand enough for it to upset me. Mark Twain said, it's not the things that bother I don't understand that bother me, it's the things I do understand that bother me. <laughs> but you take Zachariah, you know, he sees this vision of these four horses in the, in the bottom by the myrtle trees, one red, one speckled, and one dapple, and one gray, and the man that stood by said, these horses from the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. I don't know what he's talking about. I don't know what he's talking about. I'll tell you another one, the Song of Solomon. Boy, that's a, that's a buster, boy. You get the Song of Solomon. We have a little sister. What should we say of our little sister in the day that she should be spoken for? If she be a door, will enclose over the wall of cedar, and if she be a, a wall, we'll put a tower. I don't want the word I'm reading, man. Just, <laughs> just stuff. And so I never have written that. I probably never will. Uh, the Bible is, if it's got a book, it's a strange book. Now, a lot of things in life I'm real stupid about. Really. I'm not, not false human. I'm just real stupid about a lot of things. But by the time you're old as I am, you know what you're stupid about and what you ain't stupid about. What you're stupid about, you leave alone. Yeah. Uh, I cannot fix a car. I cannot fix a lawnmower. I cannot fix a toaster. That's true. If it's run by gasoline, I can't fix anything. <laughs> if the clock busted, if I fixed a cuckoo clock, the cuckoo would come out backwards and say, what time is it? What time is it? <laughs> I mean, I have, I have no mechanical ability at all. And I'm, I'm aware of that. Uh, if you want a car fixed, don't ever bring it to me. I'll open up the hood and say, there's the trouble right there. <laughs> When, when it comes to cars, I'm just like a, a woman. Just like a woman. I think if it doesn't run, sell it. That's all I know. It might just be out of gas. I wouldn't know. Goes up and says, well, it's your points there, and you're on. Yeah, yeah, your points. You're a Johnson Rob, and they do it. Yeah, I don't know what the cotton picking thing is. But uh, John, you, John McGraw, you ever know John McGraw? He must have been there before you got there. He's, he bought his car to me one time, about a 10-year-old used car. None, none of our students have anything under 10 years, you know. And he wanted to, the, the, the fender was rubbing against the right tire. And I said, I can fix it for you, but it's kind of a crude job. He said, well, I got to have it off. I said, okay. So I got an axe. And I fixed it. I fixed it. I hacked a chunk out of there about a foot square. It didn't bother his, <laughs> front of his fender anymore. So when it comes to stuff like, I'm real stupid, see? And stuff like, uh, like money and finances. I don't, I don't, I, you can't find a check I've ever signed in my church. You won't find my signature check in my church in 35 years. They give me a weekly salary and that's that. They all they handle all the finances. I didn't touch the finances. I'm no good at numbers. I'm no good at finances. I never wrote out a check till I was 39 years old. You don't believe that, do you? 39, I dealt with cash. I never had a car till I was 28 years old. So how'd you get around? I walked, man, I walked. I tell my boys sometimes, I say, what do you think your two feet are for? They say, one for the gas, one for the brake. <laughs> <laughs> but I came up the hard way, just crude way. We didn't have air conditioners. I was raised in Kansas, 114 in the shade. There weren't any air conditioners. There wasn't any attic fan. Little old fans were on the table, you know. <sighs> you know. You get hot at night, leave your door open. And coming up that way, this things I just never learned. I was in the military all that time. People were all military. When I was, honest to God, when I was saved, outside of radio announcing and playing drums in a dance band, all I knew was how to kill people. That's all I knew. All I've been trained to do. I've never been a civilian. CMTC 17 and 18, ROTC 18, 19, 20, 21, basic training in officer cabinet school 21, 22, active duty 23, 24, 25, 26, 27 years old. I didn't know anything. I'm nothing, man. No out of no fellow income say nothing. Now I knew if you want to 
the guys come to your house at night, lie down on the floor, you know, and then yell, and if he's trigger happy, he'll shoot and get the muzzle blast and get him. But when, you, when your mouth is close to the floor, you can't tell where it's coming from. Really, in the dark. Put it on the ground at night, yell at a guy. I know if you want to spot a guy out there in the dark in the woods at night, you never look at him, you look to the right or the left. I can tell you that. If you look right at him, you won't see him. You look off where you think it is, the right or the left, you'll, you'll pick up the silhouette. Now, ain't that practical. <laughs> what a 40 hour a week you want to get out of that, man. I know how to use a, a garage, you know, take a chain or a, you know, and pull up the guy's head, take the helmet, strangle him with the helmet, if the buckle didn't slip off. And taking out a century, I could take an axe, I could cut a string around a tree at 20 feet with an axe any time, a hatchet. I'm just like an Indian, boy, to pitch that thing, cut the string right in two at 20 feet. Ain't that practical? That's all I knew. Or take a motorcyclist out, you put a cable across the road, about 30 degrees. You take him right in the ditch. Take a two and a half ton truck in the ditch, you get a strong enough one. Go and take off his head, you put it about three feet above the ground and make a piano wire. <laughs> Well, anyway, uh, there's, there's some things, there's some things, there's some things I do know. Now, what do I know? I know books. Now, I know books. I know books. I read a book a day since I was 10 years old. My reading rate right now is about 500 a minute. It was 700 before my eyes got uh, wearing out on me, about 700 a minute. I read a book a day since I was uh, 10, not counting 140 times through the Bible not counting that. And I know books. And this book is a weird book. That's the strangest book you ever got your hand on. And nothing like it. I read the Koran seven times. And the Shastas and the Puranas and the Gahava Gita and the Song of God and the uh, Paramitra Sutra and the, the Analex Confucius and all that stuff. Nothing I like this. And this thing we're studying here is going to be one of them things. And it's like this thing in Zechariah. I used to read the Bible through and I read, uh, this is that Anna and Asa that found the asses of their father in the wilderness. Well, you know, Super Bowl or what? I mean, what's that doing in a religious book? What's that got to do with salvation? This guy's name was this, this guy, they found some jackass out there in the woods. Now, what, what do you put that in here for, see? I mean, Holy Bible, you know, heaven, hell, New Jerusalem, you know, and, and, and Ruth bought home an ephah of barley to her mother-in-law. Man, what a thrill. Awesome, man. <laughs> you, you see, that's why people don't read the Bible. It's such a dull book. I mean, honest to God, folks, some of this thing is just dull as mud. Did you? Amen, brother. Did you ever try to plow through First Chronicles? <laughs> I'll bet some of you, I'll bet some of you did real good reading your Bible through till you got to Exodus. And boy, you hit Exodus at about, uh, oh, let's see, about 25, 26, 27, 28. You read the tatches of the silver covering of the loops over the saddle edge of the five and a half cubits in the Bible. Ugh, ugh, ugh. You say, what is all this junk, you know? And he went through that tabernacle five times. There's more in the tabernacle, there's more in the Bible in the tabernacle than there is in the universe. Well, why would God spend more time with the, with the coupling and the savage of the silver loops and the sockets of all this kind of stuff than he would with Mars, Venus, and the galaxies? It's a strange book for God to write. God made all that stuff out there. Why didn't he give you more information? Well, he gives you one cotton picking chapter. They got seven on Sarah. <laughs> Isn't it kind of a false balance or an abomination, Lord? Why do you give a, a Bedouin woman at milk goat seven chapters and give you one in the creation of the universe? Do you think about that? It's a weird book, man. I read through here and he said, he said, I'm going to take you to a land flowing with milk and honey, a land the Lord God cares for after the beginning of the year, the end of the year. Palestine. It's a goat hill, man. I've never been to Palestine. I don't even want to go there. It looks like West Texas. <laughs> and, and, and why would God say that about a place like, hey, man, there's no rivers in Palestine like the Missouri and the Nile and the Mississippi. There are no mountain ranges over there like the Alleghenies and the Appalachians and the Rockies. I've seen those places. 
I've been cutting out bamboo out in the bamboo thicket with the gooks out there in Bataan and seen the sun come up over Fujian and go down over Hawaii. I've seen some things. There's no place over there like that. They don't have a mountain like the, the Ghost Glockner or the Soup Spitz or Pikes Peak or Mount Everest. No place like McKinley, one of those places. They got made trees over there like redwood trees. It's a junk heap over there. Well, but God say it's the glory of all lands. I don't believe it. You ever been to Austria? <laughs> the most beautiful country you've ever seen in your life is Austria. You get over there, you, every time you turn around a corner, you think you're looking at a postcard. Honest to God, you know it's such a beautiful place in all your life. And probably next, Germany. You ever see the Appalachian in the spring or the fall? I'll be up there, I get every year, I go up there on the, on the Blue Ridge around the end of October. And a painter couldn't even paint that thing to make it look right. If you painted it like it was, it wouldn't look like a real painting. Why, well, there's nothing like that in Palestine. The glory of all lands. You know, I wonder about that thing. I think I'd been through the Bible 80 times before I got to the message. I uh, should have got along before then, but I'll tell you how it came about. I got my, I'll get to this in a minute, this Zacharon. But that uh, fellow in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, he said, Ruckman, he said, if we pay your way over to Palestine, will you take us on a tour of the Holy Land? I said, no, I ain't interested in going. And they said, well, we, we think you'd be a good guy. You know the place. I said, yeah, I know, I know it better than offense Pensacola. I taught biblical archaeology and biblical geography for 12 years. I don't like the back of my hand. And he said, well, we go there and let you take a tour of Idaho. I said, I don't care about it. I said, yes, you do. I said, buy me a round trip ticket over there and dump me off in Frankfurt. And then you pick me up on the way back from Frankfurt. <laughs> and they took me up on it and got me a round trip ticket over to Frankfurt. And then I went over to Germany five times after that. And uh, that's some country there now. That's some country. But I didn't care enough about seeing that thing over there in, in Palestine at all. I mean, just a, just a junkie. I walk around the Kelstein, Hitler's uh, uh, up there in Betcher's Garden, the, uh, the, eagle, the eagle's nest up there on top of that thing. I walk around there and I sing, I walk today where Adolf walked. And I'm <laughs> <laughs> Christians, Christians think I was committing blasphemy, you know. I got in that Kelstein one time and I told my wife, I said, you want to see something, watch this. I got a whistle, I go, that time two guys over about my age looked Germans looked up like this and looked at me looked by money looked up again you know Vermont <laughs> this is about 19 this is about 1978 and I said there look at the fever a minute watch this one I start boom <laughs> <laughs> 